Hi, Grandma here, and I'm reading Adam of the Road, and I'm reading the last chapter, which is chapter 23, Loud Sing Cuckoo. I think that's a song that um, Adam and his dad sing. The picture we have is of Adam holding his new gift, a bagpipe, with his dog Nick by his side, and he looks like he is uh, shaking hands with uh, a, a, a very well-dressed gentleman who is also wearing minstrel clothes. You notice the fringe on the bottom of their clothes and how ornate the coat is. But look at the fancy hat. I am assuming that that is his father, but we'll find out soon. April came. The barley pricked through the earth, spreading a yellowish green veil over the fields that Adam had helped to plow. Primroses were budding. The first swallow dipped and swooped across the sky. Adam said goodbye regretfully to War and, or to, excuse me, to Watt and Ganilda, Robin and Dickon and the oxen, and to all his friends in the village. They were sorry to see him go, for they had never before had a minstrel of their own, and they would miss the gaiety he brought them, but they were proud too that they sent him away clothed in bright clothes as a minstrel should be, with leather shoes on his feet, a bagpipe under his arm, and his dog at his heels. Late in the afternoon, he walked across the water meadows toward the walled city of Oxford. The sun was in his eyes as he came, and long shadows stretched toward him. A score of towers and spires behind the gray wall were touched with gold and purple, and on the fresh earth fragrant air, the bell shook out silver melody. Adam soon found that though Oxford from the outside looked like an enchanted city filled with meditative peace, inside it was so full of hurry and noise and people and confusion that it seemed as if the walls must fly apart from the pressure of it. There were almost as many church spires as there had been at Winchester and a castle loomed up massive and threatening on its mound. There were inns and houses and shops, some fine, some mean, all jammed together and more people on the street. Adam thought then there could be packed under the available roofs. Three times before he was fairly in the city, he was jostled by hurrying people who seemed not even to see him. He tightened Nick's leash and walked slowly up the street turning his head this way and that, trying to see everything at once. He saw white friars and gray friars. Remember, that's the color of their cloaks. He saw monks in their dark robes, students with eager faces and shabby gowns, an herbalist crying his herbs and promising mir miraculous cures for all ills, from sore throat to lovesickness, a carter with a load of timber, a countryman with a pig under his arm, a merchant in a long fur-trimmed purple mantle, an archer with a crossbow. There was no end, it seemed, to the hustling crowd. At the crossroads in the center of the city, he was suddenly shoved against the wall as people pressed back to let a man have free passage. Adam stood on tiptoe to see who it was. He was running in the direction of the castle and he wore a badge with a king's gold leopards and carried a spear. His face, Adam could see, was set and strained and he lifted his feet as though they were heavy. The crowd closed in behind him and Adam had room to move again. Who was that? He asked curiously of a student who was beside him. Oh, the king's messenger, answered the young man carelessly. He does better with his feet than most of us poor scholars would ever do with our heads. He gets three pence a day on the road and an allowance for shoes besides. Hmm, I bet he needs the shoes, said Adam feelingly. What was his message about, do you suppose? The scholar shrugged. How should I know? Do you think the fighting is over in Wales? The scholar had gone and he got no answer. He found someone else to ask where Mer Merton College was. The parson at Ulmi had got Perkin a place there as one of the incorporated scholars. Go past All Saints Church 
past St. Mary's, that's the second one, and turn down the lane to the right till you come almost to the city wall. It was a fine place, he thought when he saw it, that Perkin had come to live and study in. There were several buildings, a smallish one with a steep stone roof, a long low one, a half-finished chapel with scaffolding over it, a kitchen, if Adam's nose was any judge, and a hall with a great oak door all banded and barred with fine ironwork. While he stood there shivering in the shadows, gone suddenly chilly, the hall door swung open. He had a glimpse of long tables inside and people moving about in candlelight. Still holding Nick on the shortened leash, he climbed the stone steps and asked the first person he met for Perkin Watson. Now, if you remember, Perkin's father's name was Watt. So Perkin is Watt's son. Uh, so this is the time when people started having surnames. Uh, my grandmother's name, her before she married, was Watson. The boy turned and bellowed into the long room, Perkin! Perkin was new at Merton and young besides, but he was not shy. He hailed Adam with joy admired his new clothes, patted Nick, and dragged them into the hall, announcing loudly, here's a minstrel. Some went on with what they were doing. One or two lifted an eyebrow as they went on, but several gathered around Adam. How good are you, said one flatly. Listen, you can judge yourself, answered Adam promptly. He sang the cuckoo song, and they listened. He sang his own song about being a minstrel, and two more added themselves to the circle. When he sang, My Love is to the Greenwood Gone, they joined in. And finally, they all broke into Gadimus Egitur and drowned Adam out. The lusty song that the students were singing all over Europe, urging one another to rejoice when they were young, for after youth and after age comes the grave swelled out, filling the hall, and died away. Before a new song could be started, one of the scholars, who was older than the rest, jumped off the table where he'd been perched and said to Adam, you've got a rare voice. Stay and have some supper with us. He's one of the seniors who governs the college, Perkin whispered. Supper came in before long, and Adam was glad. It was preceded and followed by a long Latin grace, rattled off by one of the scholars so fast that Adam could not separate one word from another. That was pretty good time, Perkin told him. They try to see who can do it the fastest. Adam shared his supper with Nick, handing bits down under the table to him from time to time. The talk at the table was all of the king's messenger. The king has called a parliament at Westminster, said the senior whom Adam thought of as his friend. Is that all? commented a rosy-faced boy, breaking his bread to dip it in the cup of ale. Adam remembered the talk about parliaments in the strangers' hall at Winchester. Who goes to parliaments, he said indignantly. The big churchmen and the nobles. Do the common folk go? They do not. The senior pointed a long finger at him. That's just where you're wrong, my young rooster, he said. This one is different. For the first time, the commons are going to parliament. Two citizens are burgesses from each city and borough town. The warden was with the, <coughs> excuse me, the warden was with the sheriff of Oxfordshire when the message came and he saw it. That's what concerns all, said King Edward, should be approved by all. And that, my fellow scholars, if you could but see beyond the black letters on the books you bury your long noses in, is more important than any examinations you may or may not be passing. So what the messenger had was the information that Parliament was not going to be just people of nobility, but was going to include the common folk, uh, representatives from each uh, town or borough. His fellow scholars, whose noses were of varying length, unified, united in groan. He's off again. Adam's mind went back to the old Gafford at Bufford Bridge. What was it he'd said about great things happening before people's eyes and they not seeing anything out of the ordinary? 
Perhaps the messenger that Adam had seen today was one like that. He sat dreaming till Perkin nudged him to go on with his meal. After supper, Perkin showed Adam over the college. Here's where we sleep, he said, and when they came into the long, low building that Adam had noticed earlier, it was a big dormitory, rather like the one at school, but with corners partitioned off as to serve as studios. That's my bed there. You can sleep with me tonight. Look out the window. Through the narrow window, they saw the meadows beyond the city walls shining in the moonlight. See that tower over there near the bridge? Said Perkin, that's Friar Bacon's study. Well, who's he, said Adam, unimpressed. Oh, he's a very learned friar. Some say he's a magician. Friar Bacon says, <clears throat> went, went on Perkin when they rested their elbows on the window sill by side and leaned out, that there are four grounds of human ignorance. One is the placing of confidence in the opinion of the inexperienced. That is to say, he explained, bumping himself against Adam. If I place confidence in your opinion, that would be a cause of my ignorance. And another is the hiding of one's lack of knowledge with a parade of superficial wisdom, which might be a cause of your ignorance, he stopped. And what, said Adam calmly, hooking his ankles suddenly around Perkins and almost bringing him to the floor? are the other two causes of human ignorance. Those, said Perkins simply, I have forgot. Ho, oh, cried Adam, a scholar's life is easy. If a minstrel forgets, he doesn't get any dinner. That gives me an idea, said Perkins. We'd better go to bed now before anybody turns you out. It was a tight squeeze in the narrow bed, and Adam was nervous anyhow, not being at all certain that the college authorities would want him to be there if they knew. When he did go to sleep, he dreamed that the warden came and with a thundering voice ordered the senior to throw him out the window. He was relieved when morning came and they rolled out early before the other sleepers in the room were stirring. You know what, said Perkin when they were drawing water from the well to wash in, I think you ought to stay here. There are some poor boys who aren't ready for the university yet that they keep here and teach. And when there's a vacancy among the scholars, they move up the head poor boy. A scholar gets lodging, teaching, clothes, and pocket money all the time he's studying. I should think they might take you. You've got more brains than half of these lumps. It wouldn't hurt to ask. Adam remembered the Abbot Stewart at Watlington and the message he told Adam to give the warden of Merton but he shook his head. I don't want to be a clerk, he said. I'm a minstrel, listen. High overhead, a bird went flying. Cuckoo, it called, cuckoo. The first cuckoo, now spring had really come. The quadrangle suddenly looked different. The grass seemed greener. The primroses beside the gate had burst into bloom during the night. Over the steep roof of the last treasury building, a beech tree showed a tracery of tiny green leaves against the sky. Everything sparkled in the early sunshine and the air smelled of spring. Cuckoo, called the, came the call again more faintly. It's time for me to go to Ludlow, said Adam. Perkin begged him to stay and go to the morning lecture with him, promising that after that, afterward, he would walk out beyond the North Gate and say goodbye there. Adam agreed. He was sorry to leave Perkin, but there was no one except Roger with whom he'd like so much to be. The lecture, which was all in Latin, was given in the hall. Adam was heartily sick of it long before it was finished. After all, he thought, squirming and sighing, he hadn't much time to spare. He was still more impatient when, just as he and Perkin had got out into Merton Lane, a boy came running after them with the word that the warden wanted to see them. Me, said Perkin, turning pale. Why do you think he's worried? That's what turning pale means. I think he's worried that the warden has found out that he kept Adam overnight. Both of you, 
Hmm, maybe, worried Adam, I oughtn't to have stayed with you last night. At the best, it would mean delay. At the worst, he did not know what fearful academic penalties there might be. He was tempted to make a run for freedom, but he knew he could not leave Perkin to face alone whatever it might be. They turned in silence and went back across the quadrangle to the warden's lodging. Come in, a voice answered their knock. Adam opened the door. There were two men in the paneled room, but he saw only one. Roger, he shouted. Roger in his striped silk surcoat came striding toward him. Before the warden and Perkin, they merely shook hands. But in that instant, Adam noticed that Roger had a fine pair of embroidered gloves and that he took off the right one to shake hands with Adam as if he'd been a nobleman. Roger's hand was warm and strong. Adam clung to it, too happy to speak. How did you know he was here? burst out Perkin. I got to Ludlow earlier than I expected, replied Roger, and the steward of the Abbey of Beck was there holding court. He told me that he had met you and that he had sent you to the warden of Merton, so I came here to find you. The good warden says the abbot steward spoke well of you, Adam, and you may have a place here if you wish. Would you like that? No, thank you, said Adam steadily. I'm a minstrel. I want to be on the road with you. I thought you would, said Roger. He went on talking to give Adam time to recover from his surprise. I gave Hugh the war horse. He said to tell you he will lend him to you when you return. Simon is a knight now and has put away childish things. He sent you his silver flute, which is a fine thing for a young minstrel. Marjorie told me to be sure to bring you back to sing to her. He looked down at Adam who stood happily and sturdy and tall in his homemade blue and red with his dog at his side, a bagpipe under his arm. Roger's mouth twitched at the corners, but his gray eyes deep under the square brow were tender. You have done well, son, he said. Well, I have to agree. I think he's done very well. He's made so many friends along the way and he's grown as a minstrel also. So he, it wasn't just him, you know, traveling along the road. He was helping people along the way. He was getting more stories really for himself to tell when he became a minstrel. He's written new songs. I think it's been a wonderful journey for him. Thanks for staying with me. Bye-bye.